You know, last week we were actually in Acts chapter 10 also, but we focused in on the particular message about Jesus in that text that Peter delivered to Cornelius, his family, and his close friends. Uh, But as I mentioned last week, we are going to take a deeper dive this week into Cornelius' conversion account, uh, because that was a situation that God used to convince Peter and the Jews in Jerusalem a little bit later that Jesus really meant it He did when he called the disciples to be witnesses to the ends of the earth in Acts 1.8. Jesus meant the gospel to go to the Gentiles. If you're not familiar with the term Gentiles, simply those who were not Jewish, to the non-Jews. Even though God had declared about 750 years prior to this through Isaiah that he would make his people a light to the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth, he said in Isaiah 49. Even though the Holy Spirit inspired Peter to preach on the day of Pentecost that the promise of forgiveness of sins, the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit was for everyone who would repent and get baptized into Christ, he said, for all whom the Lord our God will call, in Acts 2.39, Peter himself preached that. Even though those things had already happened, the actions of the disciples up to this point in the historical narrative of the early church seems to indicate that perhaps they thought to the ends of the earth just meant reaching the diaspora, which were the Jews who had been scattered into different nations. See, their prejudices ran deep. I mean, when generation after generation after generation had been told to think of the Gentiles as dogs. And to be a people who had, throughout centuries, been under oppressive leadership of Gentile nations. Their prejudices were deep. The type of hatred, the type of bigotry that they had is very hard to overcome. Um, I mean, they... Jews wouldn't even be hospitable or eat with Gentiles. So it's not that hard to see where they would think, well, is salvation really for them? I mean, we don't even associate with them. There were some definite walls that needed to come down. And in Acts 10, we see God take three extreme measures to convince his people that, yes, even the Gentiles were included when God said he desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And and our study this morning won't be so much about the prejudices themselves, but really the beauty of the working of God in helping his people back then and us today understand his desire for salvation. title of the lesson this morning is When the Walls Come Tumbling Down. Um, If you're familiar with the John Mellencamp song, it will be stuck in your head, trust me. So... Um, You know, let's look at the scenario going on in Acts 10. We touched on it some last week. This week we're going to cover it in its entirety. And so, just be prepared. It's a large section of Scripture. Let's start. Acts 10, verse 1. At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius! Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. The first measure we see God take is an angel. He uses an angel. You know, Cornelius was essentially like a non-commissioned officer. Uh, In the Roman army, it'd be today similar to like a sergeant at arms. You know, he was in charge of, centurion meant he was in charge of a hundred soldiers. But he was also a part of a group called the God-fearers. 
Now, that was a, a label given to Gentiles who believed in the God of Israel, Jehovah, but they had not converted to Judaism. So the men had not been circumcised. Uh, they did not hold to the law of Moses. They wouldn't have participated in the different rituals necessary to become a proselyte to Judaism. But we can see from his life that his belief in Jehovah God was not without substance. We're told that he was generous to the needy. We're told that he prayed to God regularly. We even, we're even told that God took note of how he gave to the poor. And so God sends an angel to tell him to send for Peter. And so Cornelius sends three people to Joppa to get Peter. Uh, this was the first extreme measure we see God take in this narrative, the angel that he sends. And this angel, we'll see later on in the narrative, wasn't just for Cornelius, but him sending this angel was also helpful to Peter and the Jews with Peter. We'll see that in a bit. So let's go ahead and change scenes to what's going on in Joppa. Skip down to verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet, sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius, the centurion. He is, righteous, he is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guest. The second extreme measure we see God doing here is the vision that he gives to Peter. He had sent an angel to Cornelius, telling Cornelius what to do, and then he's working on Peter through a vision as he prays. You know, Leviticus chapter 11 defined for a Jew which animals they could eat. They could eat from the animals classified as clean, and they couldn't eat from the animals classified as unclean. So God gives Peter a vision that included both unclean and clean animals and says, eat, kill and eat, Peter. And of course, Peter's offended, even though in Mark 7, Jesus, are, Jesus had already declared all, all foods clean. But food is not the point of this vision. God is using this vision to bring down the walls in Peter's mind and all Jews about the people that they saw as unclean, meaning the Gentiles. You know, we saw there in, uh, we'll go back here in verse 16, God didn't want Peter to miss this. We're told three times God gave him this vision. And as Peter is trying to figure it out, those messengers from Cornelius show up. Now, they were aware of how they were viewed by Jews. They knew they were not welcomed by Jews, so they actually stop outside of the gate. And yet God tells Peter, I'm the one who sent these people. Go with them even though you have viewed them as unclean. This is the reason I gave you this vision three times, Peter. And then it's cool to see the walls slowly coming down. In verse 23, Peter invites these Gentiles in to be guests. This would not have happened before the three times vision. Them being welcomed in as guests. Let's continue reading. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. 
The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Isn't it cool to see the walls just tumbling down here in Peter's mind and his heart? I mean, he acknowledges in verse 28 the very thing we've been talking about regarding Jews and Gentiles associating with each other. He's like, you know, this simply does not happen. But God's vision had gotten through to Peter as he's realizing he needs to stop viewing the Gentiles as unclean simply because they're not Jewish. As Peter asks, why did you send for me? He's about to realize that the distinction between God's people and those who are not God's people was not about race in the new covenant in Christ. It's about grace. And God desires His grace to be received by Gentiles also. Let's keep reading. Cornelius answered, Three days ago I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. The walls continue to come down. Peter says, I now realize. But it took intervention from God. It took a three times vision from God for Peter. And now, hearing that God even sent an angel To a Gentile? I mean, as Cornelius tells us, this angel appeared to me. We see how that first extreme angel is now helping Peter and the Jews with him to convince them, tell these people about Jesus. Let's continue. You know the message God sent to his people, to all of it, to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ to his Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And and this is the message of Jesus we we looked at last week. Preached thoroughly through it. I'm not going to be covering the message itself much in detail today. But we know that Cornelius and and, and the people there, they were aware of Jesus. He says, you know of him. I mean, the word of Jesus spread. This was in Judea. Caesarea is only 50 miles away from Jerusalem and, and not that far from Galilee where Jesus did a lot of his ministry. He's like, you're aware of him. But Cornelius has said, okay, but we're here for the things God commanded you to tell us. So once he says, you're aware of the things that went on, he's like, but look, he died on a cross. And God raised him from the dead. And the reason of all of this is for forgiveness of sins for people. Because he is the judge of the living and the dead. And and God has appointed us as witnesses to tell you about this. 
He delivers the gospel truth to Gentiles. All good so far. But God is going to intervene one more time in this scene. Because as we will find out as we read up through Acts 11 and the explanation of what took place, Peter and the Jews that were with him, as well as the Jews he was going to have to answer to later in Jerusalem, they still weren't fully convinced yet at verse 43. Remember, as God-fearers, his, their audience had not converted to Judaism. No circumcision had taken place for the men. There was no commitment to the law of Moses for any of them. And these were huge obstacles for Jews, including Jewish Christians. I mean, these were obstacles that would continue throughout the New Testament. The entire book of Galatians is addressing this issue still existing in the minds and hearts of Christians who are Jewish. In Acts chapter 15, the whole chapter is going to deal with this whole prevalent idea amongst the Jews that someone needs to convert to Judaism in order to be a candidate for salvation through Christ. And therefore, a third extreme measure in this scenario takes place from God and that is the Holy Spirit. Let's continue. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished. Greatly astonished is what the word is in the Greek. That the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. I mean, this is a beautiful, beautiful event. God intervening this way. It was shocking to the Jews that were there that this would happen. The Holy Spirit to Gentiles? But I think we can tend to miss the beauty of what's taking place here because of Christendom's obsession over the last 250 years with arguing about baptism. So we get confused about this passage. And the confusion centers around the Holy Spirit coming on Cornelius, his family, and his friends in verse 44 before they get baptized in verse 48. So people can wonder, well, so is this section of Scripture contradicting the very clear teaching on salvation in Acts 2 that promises His Holy Spirit to all people upon baptism, not before baptism? baptism. And admittedly, this is a very unique event that takes place in Acts 10. There's only two times in Scripture that the Holy Spirit comes down on groups of people. In Acts 2, at Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit came down on the group of the apostles and they started speaking in foreign languages. And here, where the Holy Spirit comes down on a group of people and they start speaking in foreign languages, oftentimes people refer to this in Acts 10 as Pentecost for the Gentiles. Now note, the Holy Spirit did come on different individuals at times, but for groups of people, twice. You know, we're going to attempt to resolve the confusion that can come from this by comparing what happened here with the clear teaching of salvation in Acts 2, but also by looking at the very simple explanation that God gives through Peter in Acts chapter 11. So let's read that explanation in Acts 11, and we're going to see why Peter even needed to give an explanation. Acts 11 verse 1, the apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, 
the circumcised believers rejoiced with them that the Gentiles had received the gospel. No, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. So starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. See, word spreads, and instead of the circumcised believers rejoicing, they criticize Peter for going into a Gentile's house and eating with them. I told you, the walls were big that needed to come down. That's the reason Peter even needs to give an explanation of what happened. And starting in verse 4, starting from the beginning, he, he tells them the whole story of the vision of the sheet coming down and, and, and the animals. And I'm not going to reread verses 5 through 9. We, we already read the story for the sake of time. Other than I do want to start back up in verse 10, where Peter tells them this happened three times. And then it was all pulled back up into heaven. That makes me laugh a little bit. You know, not only did God give the vision three times, he makes sure the scripture records twice that he gave the vision three times. So then Peter explains what happened after the three times vision. He says, right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. So he's already told them about the vision. He's now told them about the angel. He's told them about Two of the extreme measures that took place. And, you know, some of the confusion in this passage, Acts 10, arises from a wrong explanation of what took place in verse 44. Some say that, well, the Spirit came on Cornelius and his companions because they were already saved. And that comes about because of reading the description of Cornelius in Acts 10 to think that indicates well, they were saved. I mean, he gave to the poor. He prayed to God regularly. And so, therefore, he must have been saved. And you know what? Hey, he and his family probably would be accepted as star members of most churches nowadays. You know? But, devout, being devout, doing good to others, it's commendable, but those things don't save us. Jesus saves us. Cornelius was clear in verse 14, after the visit of the angel, that he and his family still needed the message of salvation, implying that they understood they were lost, and he communicates that clearly to Peter. He says, look, the angel told me you're going to bring a message through, through which we're going to be saved. He understood that. And... We've got to make sure, I, I think we're, we know we need to spread the gospel, and we tend to pre prejudge people, both ways. We meet someone and immediately assume they're not right with God, but we do the other as well. We immediately assume they are right with God, because maybe they seem devout. The Word of God determines if someone is right with God, and I mention that because I wouldn't be here. If the person who sh initially shared the gospel with me would have just taken my assessment of my spiritual condition, one of the first questions they asked me was, are you a Christian? And I said, yes, I'm a Christian. If they'd have just left it there, I would not be a Christian. Because I wasn't one. I needed the message of salvation that God had sent this person to me to give me. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one in this room that had an experience like that. Let's keep reading. Because he's only told them about two of the interventions of God so far. Verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as He had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as 
he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections. And praise God saying, so then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. And this addresses another confusion that can come up in this passage. Okay, so if we accept that they weren't saved, as it clearly states in verse 14, then why would the Holy Spirit come on them at all before they were baptized into Christ? And Peter tells them, and therefore us clearly, that the Holy Spirit didn't come on the Gentiles in verse 44 of Acts 10 for the Gentiles' benefit. The Holy Spirit came on the Gentiles for the Jews' benefit. Peter included. Because even after Jesus had told Peter and the other apostles to go make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ in Matthew 28, even after Jesus had told them, you're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth in Acts 1, even after the angel appears to Cornelius and some of the walls come down, even after the three times vision to Peter and some more of the walls come down, Peter states here that it took the Holy Spirit coming on them as he had come on us at the beginning, which was Pentecost, Acts 2, for the final bits of the wall to come down in his own mind. Peter needed the Holy Spirit to come on the Gentiles in order to finish the message of salvation. Because he goes, man, if God would allow his spirit to come on these people who are not circumcised, okay, then who am I to stand in the way of salvation? It took what happened in Acts 10, 44, the Holy Spirit coming on the Gentiles to convince Peter to finish the promise of salvation in verses 47 and 48. Let, let's, let's look at that again. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even to Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. That was the proof to them. Then Peter says, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Once he realizes that salvation is available to the Gentiles, he orders. Some versions will say he commands that they be baptized into the name of Christ. Why? Well, I said we're going to compare this with Acts 2 to see if there's any contradictions. You know, back in Acts 2, in verses 20 through 24, Peter had preached a very similar message he preached in Acts 10 about the death and resurrection of Jesus. And then in verse 36, as he wraps up that message, Acts 2 is a message to Jews. He says, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. After re-emphasizing the gospel message there in verse 36, that Jesus is Lord, he is Messiah, he was crucified, we're told that the people were cut to the heart. They asked, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. He then promises that forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit are the promises of this. And he goes on to say, as I've referenced a couple times already this morning, that this promise would hold true for everyone whom the Lord our God will call from this day forward, which would have included Cornelius and his Gentile crew. But Peter's the one who needed the walls to come down in order to really believe that this was for all whom the Lord our God would call. And once the Spirit came on the Gentiles, he believed it. From the three measures God took, the angel, the vision, and finally the
miraculous coming down of the Holy Spirit that was proven through the speaking of other languages, Peter finally delivers the promise by ordering them to be baptized into Christ so that they too would receive forgiveness of sins. Remember his message was one by which they must they would be saved and that they would receive the promised gift of the Holy Spirit to dwell in them that day forward, not just come on them in a miraculous way. There really is no contradiction between what happened in Acts 10 and the message for all people given in Acts 2. Peter did not change his message. He did not change his doctrine for the Gentiles. God just had to act in an extreme way to convince the messenger to actually deliver the full message to the Gentiles. You know, noted Bible scholar John Oakes has this to say about that section in Acts 10 that, that can be confusing. It says, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is not a sign of salvation, but a sign of the coming of the kingdom of God. In Acts 2, it was the sign of the coming of the kingdom to the Jews. And in Acts 10, it was a sign of the coming of the kingdom and salvation to the Gentiles. If you look at Acts 11, 15 through 18, you see that this is how Peter and the apostles and other leaders interpreted the events. The Holy Spirit fell on Saul in 1 Samuel 19, 23, and we certainly would not think of this as a sign of his being saved. I agree with most commentaries that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit had to do with showing to the prejudiced Jews that salvation was for Gentiles too. That is what Peter's vision was about, and it's what the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was about. In Acts 10, the miraculous outpouring was followed by the baptism of the Gentiles and their salvation. I assume that it was then, when it was when they were baptized, that they received the indwelling Holy Spirit and when they were saved. You know, as I stated earlier, if we can see past any confusion of this passage, what takes place in Acts 10 is beautiful. It is beautiful. It is a story of a father in heaven so consumed with love for all people that he would go to extreme measures to bring down the walls of prejudice in the hearts and minds of his messengers of the gospel so that Gentiles also could receive salvation. You know, before we take the Lord's Supper, I, I want us to contemplate this briefly with some questions to ask ourselves. I mean, obviously the extremes God would go to, we're, we're beneficiaries of that. I mean, I, I'm not going to ask you, show of hands. Most of us in here are probably Gentiles, if not all of us. And so these measures uh, apply to us. But we, as followers of Jesus... Do we have the same passion to see souls saved? Are we being messengers of the gospel to others? Or are there walls that need to be brought down in our own hearts and minds? And maybe they're not walls of prejudice, but maybe they're walls of apathy. Maybe they're walls of idolatry where we're just consumed with other things in our life that have nothing to do with what God's consumed with. Maybe it's walls of comfort that we don't, we don't want them to come down because I'd rather have my comfort than be uncomfortable in helping someone else. I don't know the answer to that, but if we're not actively involved in the mission of spreading the gospel, there's likely some sort of wall that needs to come tumbling down in our own lives. Because we can look at these measures and they're beautiful. The angel, the vision, the Holy Spirit intervening. But those measures are simply in addition to the extreme measure God had already gone to. Sending His Son from heaven to earth. To be beaten, betrayed, die on a cross. To pay the penalty for our sins. What an amazingly beautiful Father in heaven we have that would go to any extreme for us to have salvation. And what an amazing Lord and Savior we have in Jesus.
And that's who we celebrate as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper right now. Thank you.